Okay, um, I think we may as well start there. So welcome to everyone uh, that's just joined us. Uh, this is the Joy Track um, for the Scala Love Conference. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Please do post your questions to the Q&A section if you were on Zoom. And if you're joining us via Twitch, please just post in the chat there. I am trying to monitor that as well. And at the end of the talk, if we run out of time, there will be a link to a breakout room where you'll have be able to have a much more interactive session with Kai. And yeah, I, so now I'll introduce him. Kai is a software engineer at Septal Mind. He maintains and contributes a lot of open source Scala libraries. Some of you may know him from his work on the Azumi family of libraries it's like DStage, Logstage, Idealingua, and by his and Septal Mind's addition to Zio, such as Zio Tracing and Azumi Reflect. Now, Kai is going to be talking us through Scala, functional programming, and team productivity. Over to you, Kai. Uh, hi, and thank you for coming. Uh, originally, I was supposed to give this talk together with Pavel Shershev, uh, the founder of Septal Mind and a uh, great Scala developer. However, he's been too busy to join, so I will give both parts of the talk. As a disclaimer, uh, most, of his, most of the ideas are, that are presented are his. So the title of our talk is Scala, Functional Programming, and Team Productivity. Uh, it's a worst story, a chronicle of what we've been through in order to radically improve the development process at our client's company. Um, yeah. So first of all, let us introduce ourselves. We are Pavel and Kai. Uh, and we are from Septal Mind, an Irish software development consultants. Uh, we focus on productivity of engineers and team efficiency, and we're big fans of Scala and purely functional programming. Also, we participate and contribute to a variety of open source Scala projects. As a consultancy, what do we do for our clients? We identify productivity issues and blockers in their software development pipelines, and we create tools to address those issues. Now, it's important to not try and reinvent everything, so we decided to commit to a new tool. Only a single engineer can deliver a working prototype in two weeks or less. Uh, so let's start with our story. Uh, this client, we started working with them in January of 2018. They have millions of users and about 100,000 new solutions each month. When we started working together, they had about 30 engineers. Uh, the backend consisted of about 10 microservices in multi repos, some are written in Scala, and some are written in Go. On front end, they've had several mobile apps and a complex web portal. It's also worth mentioning that at the time they were using Scala as Java Plus with Aka HTTP and Juice, and also they had C Sharp, Go, and TypeScript at various points of the set. So by June of 2019, we managed to reduce their development costs by 50% according to their own estimation. Uh, that number was quite impressive when I heard it. I'm going to tell you what led to it. You can't actually squeeze a 50% improvement out of an already great process. Uh, these numbers appear when you're getting rid of blocker issues. So what was that big blocker holding the team back so much? Late problem detection. The actual integration of the product has been happening only in production. Uh, lots of issues are going to pass only after deployment. She has bugs, API incompatibilities between microservices, and incompatibilities between front end and back end. Uh, the team didn't have enough didn't have enough insight about their product, and it was hard to debug problems after failure. And it was hard to just observe the entire product at once because the code was spread across about thirteen repositories with one for back end and two for ops. And plus, it was always painful to bring new people on board. A new engineer had to memorize a lot of working ratios and set up a lot of stuff before you could get started. So I'd say that the primary problem was a uh, lack of real continuous integration. And by continuous integration, I mean the full original meaning of the term, that is, automatic testing of all integrations between components after each commit. 
And it isn't just about running the builds automatically, that's just the beginning. Because most of interactions integrations these days are with other services that are outside the code base, you can't check with the compiler. Uh, the problems I mentioned are fundamental, and at some level they will always be present in working software, but we did manage to improve the situation for that team, so for that team somewhat. What did we do first? We introduced our own interface definition language to automatically generate uh, compatible type check interfaces for remote roles within all components of the product. Uh, microservices, front end and back end, clients and servers. We added better insights using our own structural log library log stage. Uh, we helped the team set up a better GIF flow and moved to a monorepo, which in this case was very beneficial. We've put a lot of effort into improving code quality. We've taught the team purely functional programming and adopted tagless final style with bifunctor effect type across the code base, where bifunctor means typed errors, no thrown exceptions, for better control of uh, the errors that have never. As part of that, we implemented state of the art asynchronous stack traces for Zeo. Uh, the Zeo trace mentioned by Chris before. Uh, before, using PRFP and asynchronous programming install meant having to say goodbye to stack traces, and that was a blocker for adoption of PRFP in the team. We just, we just had to fix that. But I believe the most important items are next. So for the rest of the presentation, we'll talk about the things in bold. As we've added fast and reliable tests and integration tests, we've we shaped the back end into a so-called flexible monolith for a multi-tenant application, which was the key for complete continuous integration. And by doing all that, we greatly simplified the onboarding of new hires. So here is a summary table of uh, key problems we identified and the solution we applied. Uh, for now, let's focus on tests and microservices. Uh, what was wrong with the tests? First of all, their speed. There were some 600 tests which required about 10 minutes to run. And of those 20 minutes, about 17 was for a component startup and shutdown. And it was hard to run the test in parallel because of the interference between tests modifying the same records in the database and conflict and breaking each other. Then the external dependencies were slow and hard to set up. And then it was hard to wire the applications with dummy in memory implementations because juice while juice has overrides it requires a lot of manual rituals to wire a task with dummy implementations and what was wrong with the microservices uh, first of all it's hard to share and reuse code with multiple repositories uh, because of that multiple copies of the same code appeared in different repositories it was easier to just copy and paste rather than spend time moving code snippets into a shared library and then publishing it locally. You could wait or you could instead of wait for a CI to build and for the artifact to appear in the repository that would also take time, probably more time than it would take for you to build it locally. All that was very far from instantaneous. Then the company had one shared dev environment for all the teams because it was hard to set up the same environment on your own machine. It was hard to run dozens of Java processes for all the microservices on your laptop and set up databases and other stuff and configure it. We tried to evaluate the impact on team performance and found that depending on the task, the output was spending up to 70% of their time for typical ops activities, uh, replicating parts of the environment in, on their machines, or trying to test a live environment or waiting for environment startup. And also, automatic orchestration and deployment was a hard problem. Correctness of startup and shutdown impacts your ability to automate deploys and affects your ability to deploy isolated test development environments. The correct startup and shutdown procedures have to take care of many different aspects like action order, configuration variability, preconditions, checks, as CTRs. Notably hard to implement all that by hand. So our goals were to improve development and deployment workflows and start continuously integrating the entire microservice fleet. 
and also to improve team collaboration and simplifying work. Well, how? Uh, the key idea was to merge the many components of the product into a single highly reconfigurable application. We wanted to make the integration process more declarative and let engineers uh, define their product as a set of components and goals and make all the wiring completely configurable and automated. We call this automatic application composition. Uh, we can show you the open source framework that makes automatic application composition possible. And with it, it allows you to, uh, first of all, test your business logic with dummy implementations and then also test it with real external implementations so that you can check that your logic works very fast and then separately check that your integrations work too. Moreover, it makes writing such dual tasks an easy and a natural thing to do always. It lets you correctly share heavy resources between all the tests across an entire mod, not just in one test suite. So tests can run tests can run way faster because you're not starting and stopping the same heavy components over and over again. And you don't have to manage any kind of global mutable state to do this. It lets a new developer check out and start hacking and testing immediately as a consequence of having tests without implementations. You don't need a, a dev environment to start working. And then it lets front end engineers set up their own isolated development environments quickly and easily. And you guess that the name of the framework is DStage. Uh, let's see it in action with an example application. Uh, this application will have a repository interface with the dummy implementation and the production implementation. Then we have a service class that uses the repository and an application entry point app that in turn uses the service. Uh, we're using bifunctor type as final, so we have an effect type app with two parameters, where uh, the left parameter is the error type in app run, that this is approvable, and the right parameter is the output type, which is app run, which is in app run is a unit. Now we may declare our application components in a juice like style. But we declare that there will be an app path and a service app. And also there will be two possible implementations of repository app, uh, the dummy repository and the prod repository. We declared one of them to be repo dummy and the other to be repo prod, tag them. Um, this code on screen is enough to launch the application. Uh, note that here we specify an activation. An activation is a list of choices that tells our application which implementations to choose for those components we declared that multiple implementations for. Uh, we declare that we want a repo prod implementation for all repo components. In this case, that means that the application will use prod repository as the implementation of the repository interface. We're also using Zio as an app type and we parameterize the definition accordingly. So a uh, D-stage application is a set of recipe declaration. Each recipe takes a set of materials or values and produces a product, which is a value too. In order to turn these recipe declarations into the actual application, you need to provide a set of root products that depend on everything else and the appropriate configuration rules. All the wirings will happen automatically right before the program starts. And moreover, the wiring is computed ahead of time into a value. So you can look at it, print it, or check it for errors without performing any actual instantiations or any effects. Like Juice and other dependency injection frameworks, this stage allows you to turn application wiring code into a set of declarations and automatically order wiring actions. But actually, we can do much more. Let's look at our application declarations again. There are two definitions of the same component, a dummy repository and a production repository. Both of them implement our repository interface, but they are tagged by the so-called configuration access values, uh, repo.dummy and repo.prod. 
there may be several configuration axes used by our application. When we start our application, we'll have to define preferred values for all the axes that are used in the wire. So in our example, we have one axis, repository axis, and we wish to run our application with production repositories. Uh, so the dummy repository declaration will be ignored. Dummy repository will not be instantiated. You may declare a lot of different implementations for different interfaces and easily reconfigure your application. So this application will now use the prod repository everywhere where a repository app is required. Another important concept supported by this stage is resource. A resource is a functional description of a component lifecycle, uh, which allows you to express startup and shutdown of a component without resorting to a mutable state and without allowing objects to have an invalid uninitialized state. Resources can be wired into the object graph. Their life cycles will be performed according to the dependency order, and they will always shut down gracefully, even in case of an exception. Uh, we also provide a way to use Docker containers as resources, and a slow library of typical Docker containers used in the backend, such as Postgres, Kafka, and Cassandra. That way you can work with Docker, container, with Docker containers as with any other component in your application, and this is extremely convenient. Uh, the benefits of using these stage, such as uh, sharing components between tests, will apply to Docker components too. So you'll only have one Docker to get the start now for all of your tests. Using that, you can launch your application locally with a configuration that uses Docker's. And when it starts, it will summon the entire environment of the services it needs to run inside Docker. So you just get an extremely easy local dev environment stuff. You just have to run the application with an appropriate flag and you get everything that it requires to boot up all the databases and see. The next important concept in this stage is integration checks. They allow you to define a simple precondition check which would prevent your tests or your application from starting if the check returns false. On the slide, is a screenshot of IntelliJ test runner showing a real test suit where dummy tests were executed, but the tests that required an external Postgres database were skipped. In this case, they were skipped because we did not launch uh, the Docker daemon, so we couldn't start Postgres Docker. Uh, Uh, there is a good example on screen defining an integration check. As you can see, it's pretty easy to do. Integration checks run before all the startup actions, providing you very fast feedback and allowing your applications to fail as early as possible if an external dependency is missing. Or in case of tests, to skip those tests that can't be run without an external dependency and run the rest. They also help you implement the so-called dual test tactic when you test your business logic twice. First time against dumb implementations and the next time against real implementations. Skipping the test that can't run without external dependencies really simplifies onboarding. Someone starting with the project doesn't need to set up all parts of the environment before they can start hacking and testing the code. They can clone the repo and start immediately. Uh, the approach I mentioned before, the so-called dual test tactic, proves itself to be a very valuable tool. Uh, first of all, it allows you to draft your business logic quickly without being distracted by aspects uh, specific to your integration point. And it enforces solid design. You have to create better abstractions to accommodate both the dummy implementation and the real implementation. So it makes your code more readable, easier to maintain, and simplifies onboarding of the new team members. Some say that uh, testing with dummies is not enough because it does not reveal problems specific to the real integration points. This is true and why we promote dual tests. Then some say that uh, the benefits are not worth the effort or that it's hard to write good dummies in memory implementations of the main things. In our experience, the return from good dummies is an order of magnitude higher than the investment. Now, let's see how this page helps us implement the dual test tactic. 
uh, first of all, write an absolute test. Uh, then we define several uh, environment traits. Each environment overrides the test suite configuration. In this example, we define dummy and for tests with dummy repositories and broad end for tests with production repositories. That we extend our abstract test suite with our environments, and that's it. To reiterate, it's very easy to switch implementations in DSH, or we just declare the preferred choices along with the repo axis instead of micromanaging individual components. Note that each DSH task is a lambda where each argument declares a dependency that the stage will provide for the task. In this case, the test do something request service zero and it does something with it. The tests are written in parallel functional style using your effect moment. In this case, it's zero. Also worth mentioning that if you use zero, you can request your services implicitly using the zero environment as well. Another important tool is memoization. In this particular example, we declare DB driver zero to be shared across all our tests in all the test suits of a model, not just this single test suit. As you can see, it's very simple to manage. There are no global variables or GVM shutdown hooks or shady global objects with lazy balls that do side effects when they're used. No such hacks are required. DB driver will finalize immediately after all the test suits finish. Memoized components are shared across all the tests. They shut down gracefully. There are no global singletons involved, and different test configurations have different memoization contexts. So DB driver from production environment will not be reused in dummy environment. The memoization provided by this stage is generally sound correct. So we just had a quick look at these stage features, which let us write faster and better tests and applications. So to be short, these stage verifies correctness of all the wirings ahead of time. So unlike juice, you're not going to have 20 exceptions coming out of you out of nowhere because uh, because it somehow can't tell there isn't a dependency. Uh, whereas you can just compute ahead of time. It supports resources and resource life cycles. It provides a way to define easily configurable apps. It does integration checks before performing any effects. So if your application can fail as fast as possible if there are no integrations or you can skip the test you can run with your current environment. It can gracefully shut down your application and it can correctly share components between multiple tests and application entry points. So that's almost everything. Though there is one more concept we should look at. We call that concept roles for multi-tenant applications. And that's the last element which enables real continuous integration. Here is a code snippet showing a role definition. A role is just a replacement for a main method, but unlike main methods, there may be several roles in one process running at the same time. Combined together with automatic application composition, roles allow us to easily run multiple components or multiple microservices that compose our product in a single process for simulation or to simplify deployment. We use the term multi-tenant application for applications that can run multiple roles. On the bottom half of the slide, there are two examples of running a multi-tenant application from the command line. The first line would run two roles, users and accounts, with real prod integration points, repo prod and transfer prod. And the second line would run them with dummy repositories and dummy transports, which may be very useful for quick simulations, which are crucial for real continuous integration. To be short, roles allow us to have multiple microservices in one process, which gives us more flexibility for deployments and what is especially important for simulations. I want to emphasize that you may have a simulation or of your full dev environment or perhaps a huge part of it as a single process. Combined with the memory dummies, it gives you a way to run your simulations light and fast, even on a single machine with a single command without complex and slow stuff phase. I'm not saying these simulations are perfect or a perfect and precise replacement for a full developed environment, 
but they don't have to be. Their purpose is to let you continuously integrate your services properly after each commit. It allows you to build cheap automatic filter at the beginning of your delivery pipeline and catch significant share of the edges early on. Also, in case you need it, you may always adjust the level of imperfectness of the simulation by extending your mocks. For example, you may simulate message loss or duplication in your transport layer. And you may use access configurations to easily switch between different simulation modes. Uh, now, wish to share a dissenting opinion on microservices. We believe that the microservice fleet is itself a distributed application, and that application is the product, and each individual microservice is no more than a mere component of the product. And we should integrate these components the same way we integrate our program components. Yes, it's hard to test distributed applications, but we can catch a lot of potential issues even if we test our product in a relaxed simulation without the networking aspect. In conclusion, I wish to say that one of our productivity recipes is uh, to turn microservices into roles and allow them to coexist within a single process, to write reasonable, precise dummies for every integration point, and to make your applications easily configurable. This will let you make, make cheap models of your product, enable real continuous integration, and you will experience a lot less failures in production. Uh, roles and Roles and multi-tenant applications do not require a monorepo. Our client has migrated to a monorepo after a write of the Go code to Scala, and then we consider it feasible, but it's not a must. Before we migrate our customer to monorepo, we've set up one independent repository with internal libraries using all the microservices, uh, multiple independent repositories with different roles and their individual launchers, and one more repository with unified launcher that merged all the roles together into a multi-tenant application. While we think that a monorepo would be more beneficial because it's a lot easier to extract shared parts and observe the entire product, a multi-repo flow is also possible when you use roles. The only potential drawback is that you have to use a single stack across your roles, but actually such an approach is not a true drawback it may be very beneficial to use a single language across the company backend, especially the language is Scala. Uh, thank you for listening, and now it's time for your questions and answers. Hi, Kai. Thanks very much for that. It was a very uh, good introduction to the, what you've been doing um, at Set to My Mind. Um, there have been some questions that I think your colleague's been answering on Twitch, but I'll ask them to you as well anyway, so just for a bit more completeness. And uh, the first question was, uh, what, what tooling do you use for CI, CD? Uh, what tooling do we use to CI, CD? Uh, that depends on the customer. We don't require any kind of special tooling uh, because everything, well, these stages is the scale of the So uh, all the value added here is at the level of your application. It will work with whatever the CI you use. Okay, so, Wait, which one do you yeah, find you yeah. used more of? Uh, I would say we, no, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't want to reveal my customer details. So okay, I'm, that's fair I'm enough. Yeah, and the, uh, the next question was, what, what's the benefit of using integrated tests with dummy services rather than using mocking frameworks? Uh, this is very simple, actually, for me to answer because uh, when you use mocks, you end up testing mocks. You're not testing your application. Uh, all the code bases that use mocks, in my experience that I've worked on, they degrade it heavily because these mocks, they get out of date and inconsistent with, uh, inconsistent with, the, with the way uh, business, they get out of date with the business requirements. They need continuous maintenance. And it's way easier to just write a dummy that, well, actually does all the logic properly, that actually goes logic than to code expectations. The expectations will change when they change, you'll have to update everything. And it's just a pointless waste of time in my opinion. Like I have, and we have a set to my mind, a very, uh, very strict prejudice against mocks. 
And that's my answer to the question. Okay, fair enough. Um, another question we got is, when you're testing, can the test wait for Docker containers to be ready? Yes, that's exactly what it will do. Because uh, as the test is a function that accepts uh, that accept the dependencies, the service dependencies as uh, their arguments, it actually cannot be run before these arguments are available. Now, if your dependencies themselves depend on the running Docker container, then the Docker's acquire effect must succeed and its integration check must also pass to make sure that it's online. So yes, they will have to wait. In fact, there is actually no way they can't wait. Okay. Answer. Cool. Um, so another question we've got uh, a bit more um, a bit more open is uh, from a Java developer that really wants to work in Scala, especially fully uh, functional programming in Scala, and they want to know what 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 kind of advice you'd have to convince senior engineers to at, the, at their company to to move towards it and to take functional programming seriously. What like are the the kind of benefits and stuff that you could that they could use to sort of sell it to, to people uh, much more senior in like a, from, from an OOP background? I would say the biggest argument is productivity. You're not going to buy Java developers with talks about beauty or whatever it is that you find you like. No, uh, the biggest benefit is productivity. The biggest benefit is cutting development costs by 50% and it's not, uh, the, the cut is not from people being laid up. It's from, uh, projects have been completed way faster. And it's an experience you can, uh, that a lot of companies can testify that with disciplined use of Scala, you can get your projects done faster, better, they will uh, stand the test of time, they will work better. And uh, uh, the hiring can possibly get tough, but we will solve this by training people. Okay, uh, cool. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, do we, we did you want to add more to that? Or? Um, no, I say that both for companies and for individual developers, the answer is the same productivity, you get more done with your time and better. Okay, cool. Uh, another question we've got is uh, what kind of compile time safety? Uh, discharge guarantees where, when you're activating the application? Uh, none, but basically this isn't really an issue for, it isn't really a big issue for us because as I said before, you can compute the wiring ahead of time. So you can, you, and you can put this test on your wiring inside your test as a runtime test. Uh, so what happens is you have a very fast test that just tells you if you're missing a wire or something that happened uh, that doesn't actually execute anything, that doesn't need your application to run. This is not as fast as compile time, check, but it's close enough. Then there's also experimental uh, support for compile time checks. But this support is basically just using a macro to run the same kind of test in compile time. I do not advertise to use it because uh, uh, with in combination with incremental compilation, this macro will not be rerun twice. So it's kind of there for show, but you'll be well served by just by testing your application in runtime. Basically, if your tests pass your application, your application will run. It's possible to add more compile time safety, but uh, I just wanted to be it would change the APIs. It would make everything a lot more complex and the benefit I find not very worth it. Anyone who's, pretty much everyone who is in market for a dependency injection framework is, uh, is not gonna be too concerned about having to run a test. Like all of these questions I get is from uh, people that are very set in their ways of wiring everything manually, I, I don't you know, uh, it's a super important data. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, another question we got is, um, is contract testing integrated in, in D-Stage and uh, are there any ways to configure network timeouts for that? Contract testing and um, network timeouts. Uh, 
I don't actually want to know what you mean by contact test members, so you'll have to read it for me. But actually, if you have any kind of feature that you want to support, uh, it's you can open pull request or open an issue and request it, and it'll be okay. As for configuring network timeouts, yes, you can you can reconfigure any component in your application. So if you uh, if you represent your timeouts as a case class with durations, you can just override it in your tests and have a different one or configure it using Hawkon or these types of components. So for that means. Okay, cool. Uh, another question we got kind of related to um, to being able to implement these changes. Have you had any kind of pushback from software developers where you've you've tried to in, like you know push or destage and, and things like that on them? No, no. And this is mostly because we started with juice shops that gradually embraced functional programming, and this was fantastic for that because uh, we could start using it and. First, without really a fee, without any monies or anything, and it would readily grow with us because it supports everything you need for functional programming. Uh, so, in this case, no. Okay, cool. Um, also, someone's asked, can you, can you clarify a bit more about the, the dummy services um, that you're using instead of mocks, and are, are they effectively stubs, is the question? Um, a dummy service is also called a test double, but what that means is uh, you implement, so you have a repository, like, right? You use the repository pattern, you have an object that represents uh, the queries you can send to your database and response to get, like get, set, update. And a dummy just means you implement the same interface with the same behavior using an in-memory collection, like a hash map. You can use a mutable hash map, or you can use an immutable hash map with uh, ref, for example, from various uh, FP libraries. It, it really doesn't matter. What matters is that you have an implementation that basically does the exact same thing that you implemented in memory that doesn't require anything external, at C. So, and this forces you to design better because you can't, you can, for example, uh, pass around fragments of SQL queries because what are you going to do? Are you going to write an SQL interpreter in memory? No, you have to. You have to make interfaces that are agnostic towards the backend. And that means you have a very easy time, uh, for example, migrating databases. And this is not uh, this is not a frivolous concern. We have migrated databases uh, using the same technique. Uh, it's not okay. as my thing. Uh, kind of a related question. Uh, how do you test for failure cases with your dummy, set, dummy services? Um, the same way. The same way. If uh, basically, if there are failures that are uh, specific to your database backend, for example, list some kind of limitations in your SQL engine or some kind of limitations in your uh, in DynamoDB, well, the first thing you can do is uh, simply have the same kind of use mock the same kind of failures add them to your dummy repository add the same kind of limits or you can just ignore them and run this part of the test that is very specific only for the production repository there may be such parts it's not really uh it's not deal breaker completely especially if you're checking for especially if you have a progression because if you're checking that a failure happens and it's still not fixed that's fine okay cool uh, another question we have is do you support scala js and how does yes. uh, DI work without Scala Reflect? Yes, we support Scala GS and DI yeah, works without Scala Reflect because we have zero runtime reflection whatsoever. Uh, all the all the constructors are generated at compile time with a macro, so you don't really need to have any kind of runtime reflection there. And we we put a lot of effort into these macros so they're as fast as possible. Uh, there's not existing that uh, when it comes to compile times because they're all black box, they start hard, there is no uh, anonymous classes or anything generated. You can you can really pollute your class path if you have anonymous classes inside macros. Uh, and we we created a replacement for Scala Reflect. We created Kitsune Reflect, 
which uh, which is based on uh, questions as far well as type type. It contains type information of the type and allows you to compare types, uh, compare uh, uh, kinds of types, uh, variances, etc. So it implements subtyping and quality checks. And that's all we need. So we need to uh, compute wiring. Uh, we don't need to access some of the other uh, information inside the scholar like which is like method signatures, etc. So there's a lot of information there. There's just types and their types and their representations. And the same library, Zoom Reflect, is used in Zeo for the set of a similar purpose. It's used in Z layer uh, to store the to back the Zeo environment. So when you get a component from the Zeo environment, uh, the Zoom Reflect tag is created and it's used as a key inside the map. So we had this made for this stage and then Zlayer came Zlayer came up and they had a very, very uh, suboptimal uh, way of, uh, they used class tags and that meant you couldn't uh, have type parameters in the source because there's, uh, because class tag can support that you don't have generic type information. It's in reflect, it's in reflect it does, so we'll look at that restriction, we'll help them out. Yeah. So this library used in two parts for that. Okay. Uh, another question we've got a bit more um, uh, for the future is, are there any plans to uh, extend the integration kind of past microservice type projects and, and to more uh, data orientated projects? Um, um... Possibly, but I mean, uh, it's, you can use this stage itself as wiring. You can use it anywhere. You don't have to even declare any roles or anything like that or take over your main method. You can just use the injector and create everything you want to know, everything you want to have. So in, in this particular case, yeah, you, you basically can just go and use it in Spark or whatever you want. It'll work. Um, as as for anything more specific, better probably open an issue and describe what is it, uh, what exactly do you mean? Because, and th then then you, we can help, or you may be able to open the pull request. This is a very broad question. Okay, cool. Uh, another question may be a little bit contentious. Uh, do you feel Zio is a better interpreter than Cat's uh, IO for, for productivity? Uh, yes, because of typed errors mostly. Uh, for our use case, the zero environment type is somewhat useful for testing because you can uh, omit the arguments and have them in, be inferred in the environment. But but most of the benefit is from typed errors. It's from using bifunctor tag with final, just having that half with two parameters and knowing where errors can happen, where they can happen where they did these are dumb errors or not, what error to return to the client in case of a failure. And yeah, just having it sealed down and controlled. This is very, very productive. So I, uh, different implementations are welcome, but for now, it's, for us, it's really basically zero. Okay, and on this theme, uh, do you consider the current Zio dev uh, release candidate version production ready? Yes, it's production ready, definitely production ready. Uh, since it's been released, uh, more production ready than versus 17 because of uh, some bugs fixed. Uh, yes, it's. I think it's faster and better than the previous release. It's actually great. If you're stuck in versus 16 or 17 or anything, please update. There is no reason. Okay, cool. Um, I'm just looking around to see if we've got any more questions anywhere. I think you've answered everything that I can see. Um, so thank you again, like great presentation. Um, I'm sure everyone was, uh, was, has been very impressed with it. Uh, I will post thank a link you. now in the chat to the breakout room. So if people do have more questions for you, you can uh, go ahead there and, and answer them in that room. And, and yeah, thanks again. And yeah, just, okay. uh, just a reminder again that the breakout room is posted in the, in the Zoom chat.